Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Welcome, everybody, to No, It's Not a Genographa. No, It's Not a Long Box Carpentry. It is a brand new episode of Masters of Carpentry. I am Noel, being joined, as always, as once again, by Alexander Adrock. Hello, I have returned. I think this is the first episode that I've introduced and not you. That is true. I didn't think of that when we started. <laughs> well, no, it's good. I'm rusty, so I, I'm totally happy with you doing that. <laughs> and we are being joined by my genographer and long box carpentry co-host, JD. Hooray! I've been promoted. Hey! You are now officially adopted into the Masters of Carpentry family. <laughs> Oh. Before you were just a ward, <laughs> a skimpily clad sidekick ward. Can I call you daddy? Yes, now you can call me daddy, son. Oh, yay, dad. And that means that Kevin is now your podcast granddaddy. <laughs> this is true. This is very true. Ah, made a fail in jokes. So we are here to finally discuss Halloween 2018. The Return of the Franchise, a brand new reboot sequel-ish, mm -hmm. directed by David Gordon Green and written by Gordon Green, Danny McBride, and Jeff Fradley, which is a very interesting group to make this movie because they are primarily all known. I mean, Danny McBride is probably the most famous of them as a very comedic character actor, but he's also a frequent co-writer of David Gordon Green. And together they did films like Pineapple Express, Your Highness... The Sitter. Oh, God, The Sitter. I remember The Sitter. They're a very interesting group to bring in here. And I know the other writer, he was one of their collaborators on Vice Principals, which the two of them also did, the TV series. Have either of you seen the films of David Gordon Green and Danny McBride? Because I haven't. I have not seen any of them. I've seen Pineapple Express, and that's it. Yeah, I'm a fan of David Gordon Green's earlier dramatic indie films like George Washington, mm. and I believe he did Undertow. I haven't seen Joe yet. That was his return to his indie drama roots yeah. with Nicolas Cage, and I think he did another one as well. But I have seen Pineapple Express, which I'm a fan of, and Your Highness is not good, but I also <laughs> enjoy it very much. <laughs> it was one of those films, I remember when the trailers came out, I'm like, I don't know if I want to want to see this, because I'm worried it's not going to work. It's very much a stoner comedy, but I happen to like weird comedy and dumb comedy like that. It works for me on a primal level, mm -hmm. so I enjoyed it. Well, do you happen to remember what your initial thoughts were when this team was announced for a new Halloween movie? Excitement. I was surprised, but not terribly surprised, because that seems to be the way things are going now mm. with Get Out, because that came out earlier that same year. Yeah. You know, now we in an era where Chris Rock is taking over the Saw franchise. So it seems to be the way things are going with more comedic voices going to horror. Apparently there's a lot of crossover there. Yeah. And then just getting into a little bit of history of how this film came about. 2009 was the release of the last Halloween film before this, which was Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. Unfortunately, Dimension was struggling for a while. They've continued to put out films, just really low budget indie films, but they were not able to get Halloween 3D made in time. They lost the creative crew of that. They weren't able to continue that story. They attempted to do reboots over the next few years. JD and I get into this on our genographer episodes on Halloween's 3D and Halloween Returns. And it was announced in October 2015 that Dimension had lost the rights to Halloween because they just kept struggling to get a film made in time, which is surprising because they're kind of notorious for like with Children of the Corn and the Hellraiser franchises of just knocking out a direct-to-video sequel as quick and as cheap as they can just to hold on to rights. I'm kind of surprised they didn't do the same here. But I think part of that is because of the contracts of those rights, everything still has to go through the approval and the participation of Troncus International, which is the film company of the Akkads, 
which is now Malik Akkad. And I don't think the Akkads were willing to sign off on doing a cheap, quick, fast movie. And these other deeper consideration ones were just not coming together. And so the rights ultimately lapsed. I thought it was they lapsed back to the original rights holders, but no, they lapsed back to Miramax. Hmm. And it's worth pointing out that Miramax and Dimension have not been affiliated companies for almost 15 years at this point. The Weinstein brothers created Miramax. Miramax had a separate branch called Dimension, which was for low-budget genre stuff. And Miramax and Dimension were acquired by Disney. In the early 2000s to the mid-2000s, the Weinsteins left both companies, created their own company, the Weinstein Company. And in the mid-2000s, Disney sold off both Miramax and Dimension separately. So Miramax was sold to another company, which still allowed it to run as its own independent company. I think it's since been sold to another company. And Dimension was sold back to the Weinstein. So Dimension was still a part of the Weinstein company, and they lost the rights, and the rights went back to Miramax, which was previously a Weinstein company, but was now its own company. Hmm. Miramax had actually not produced a film in a couple of years. They've been financially on the down and outs. So they brought in Blumhouse Productions as a co-producer and Blumhouse run by Jason Blum have been really popular for like, you know, the Insidious films, Get Out. They've really made a name for themselves in the horror market lately. They're hot, hot, hot right now. Hot. Absolutely. Super hot. Jason Blum was the one who reached out to John Carpenter to pull him back in to be involved with the franchise, not to write or direct, just because John wasn't really that interested in writing and directing, especially directing with his eyes and everything. It's been difficult to do. But he came on board as an executive producer, as a story consultant. Basically, you know, he'd give notes on the script. And he did the score for the film. It's one of the first film scores he's done in years. And he did it in collaboration with his son, Cody Carpenter, and his godson. Daniel Davies. His son and his godson have been John's primary collaborators on his current music career and did the Lost Themes albums with him. <laughs> What's fascinating also is that Blumhouse has a distribution deal with Universal who released this film. Universal and John Carpenter have a very long, complicated history because he did the thing for them. But when the thing folded, he got fired from doing Firestarter. But then his production deal on Halloween's 2 and 3 were with Dino De Laurentiis, who had a distribution deal with Universal, so he was still stuck working with Universal. Those were bad experiences for him, and he was very pissed off at Universal over a lot of things. And then he left, did a few other films, and then when he signed the deal to do Prince of Darkness and They Live, that was for an independent production company who had a distribution deal with Universal. And those were on a four-film contract where they only made two films, and then he got stuck in a very long legal battle with both that production company and Universal over the fact that they never paid for two more movies. And that's why there was like a years long gap for John, during which he also tried to buy the Halloween rights back with New Line, which were then bought by Miramax, which then went to Dimension. And then John ended up doing Village of the Damned for Universal, who then took it away from him in marketing and then fired him from Creature from the Black Lagoon. So <laughs> John has not had a lot of luck with Universal. So it's kind of interesting that all paths have reconverged to John Carpenter being involved with a Halloween film produced by Miramax for Universal. So I'm sure a book could be written about this whole story. <laughs> but that's all I really have. I know John did remain involved through the end of it. He said that this is the last Halloween film, even though everyone else involved is like, yeah, we've already got a sequel online. Just a quick question. Now, had either of you seen this film before today? Yes. I saw it in the theaters when it first came out. But, uh, yes, same. Yeah, same here. And the reason why we held off on doing an episode back when it first came out in theaters is just to, you know, have a little time to stew on it, a little time to kind of see what the fallout and full reaction was to it. I also saw it in theaters, saw it with Angie, my co-host on Shumacast. That was a fun time. We'll get into what we think of the film and our recommends here in a second, but you guys ready for me to dive into the synopsis? Go right ahead. This film ignores all sequels and is a direct continuation of just the first movie from 1978. As that film came to a close, we learn Michael Myers was captured and has now spent 40 years incarcerated at Smith's Grove Sanitarium, where his care transferred over from the late Dr. Loomis to Dr. Ranbir Sartain, who feels that Michael has become docile even as the inmate is set to be transferred to a maximum facility for the remainder of his life sentence. The day before the transfer marks the arrival of Dana Haynes and Aaron Corey, a team of true crime podcasters, hoping to get a juicy story out of the old babysitter murders. 
They confront Michael with his old mask, but get no reaction aside from stirring up the other inmates. Next, they try Lori, who agrees to their $3,000 fee, but kicks them out after a few minutes when their prying gets too personal. Lori has spent most of her time since those murders bunkered in paranoid isolation, trading herself in weapons and security techniques for the day Michael might come for her again. This cost her a relationship with her daughter Karen, who was taken away as a teenager by child services, and Lori is now starting to connect with her now teenage granddaughter Allison, much to the objection of Karen and her husband Ray. Allison is flourishing with a new boyfriend Cameron and other friends planning to have fun the night of the upcoming Halloween dance, but is struggling with her mother due to her mother lying to her about Lori. The transport of Michael goes shockingly wrong, with him making a break for it in a stolen truck while dazed inmates and a wounded Dr. Sartain are quickly rounded up by the police, most prominently Officer Frank Hawkins, who was a deputy that day 40 years ago, and Sheriff Barker, who's hesitant to shut down Halloween. The choice is made for him when they find the gas station where Michael killed the podcasters and reclaimed his mask before heading back to Haddonfield, where he settles back in by murdering people from house to house until he scores his trademark butcher's knife. His next victim is babysitter Vicky, the best friend of Allison, and her house becomes the convergence point where both Laurie and Hawkins take Michael on, with him walking off a bullet wound. With the threat now confirmed, Laurie and the police round up Karen and Ray, taking them back to Laurie's secure home in the hidden basement panic room. Unfortunately, they can't get a hold of Allison, whose phone was totaled during a bad breakup with her boyfriend. When another friend falls victim to Michael, Allison realizes the danger and gets to police, ending up in a squad car with Hawkins and the recovering Sartain. They end up rounding a corner and spot Michael, where they try to run him over, but Dr. Sartain ends up taking a heel turn as he kills Hawkins, puts on Michael's mask, and brings Michael into the back of the squad car with Allison, as Sartain now understands the rush of having killed someone, which he feels is the main motivating factor to Michael. Sartain drives everyone out to Lori's estate, where he's killed by Michael, Allison escapes, and Michael ends up killing two deputies and Ray as he finally gets into the house, where Lori and Karen are hidden in the basement below. A whole big standoff takes place with mother, daughter, and granddaughter avoiding and fighting Michael, Lori finally taking on the guy who traumatized her years ago, Karen finally putting her survival techniques to use as they all end up luring Michael into the basement, which instead of being a panic room is in reality a trap that was set for him, as he's now barred from escape and the entire house is set on fire. The three generations of Strode women finally make their way to a road where they're picked up and taken to safety as the fire burns all around Michael, and over end credits, though, we hear his breathing behind that mask. So, Alex. Yes. Do you recommend Halloween 2018? Yes, I recommend Halloween 2018. It is not perfect. It gets in its own way with quirkiness and certain derailing characters who I'll illustrate later. But I enjoy that it retains the indie spirit of the original. It's beautifully shot. I like the character arc of Laurie Strode. I think she does a beautiful performance. Judy Greer as well, the always underused Judy Greer. And the ending is great. JD, do you recommend Halloween 2018? I do. I agree it's not a perfect film. It's a little disappointing based on the initial trailers that I think had gotten me really excited. And I don't think it quite lived up to that. But I think overall, it's still one of the better sequels in the series. It's really well directed and the acting's really good, especially the three female leads are all fantastic. The action and the kills are actually really well done. It's some of the details it loses me. But I think it's worthwhile if you're a fan of the series. And I recommend it too. It's still not topping H2O for me as my favorite of the sequels, but I think it's an interesting counterpoint companion piece to it in the way that it explores the story and the mythology and the character of Laurie. I think there's a lot of genuinely good filmmaking technique on here, but it's also kind of wobbly at times. And it's like the way in which certain things all converge or happen don't all entirely add up. I don't think the third act is really the strong. I like the ending ending, the very end of it, but there's a lot of the buildup of the third act that just doesn't quite work for me. There's other sequences that don't quite work for me. It's a bunch of annoying stoner teenagers again. It teeters, but I think it teeters more strongly. I think the strong side of the teeter definitely has a lot more of the weight on it. I do enjoy it. It's not fantastic. It's not quite the old man Myers that I I was hoping from the trailers and the poster, but I can see why it had a good reception and I do enjoy it. So let's go ahead and start with Laurie. And Alex, what did you think about this film's take on survivalist Laurie? 
Well, as you were saying with H2O, I have a whole thing about the Halloween multiverse, but <laughs> this was good because there are three to four lorries now running around in the multiverse, mm -hmm. and I enjoy H2O as well. I'm on record as stating I enjoy H2O. I think that's a really good take of the traumatized alcoholic, but more engaged socially and with her family, Lori. But I'm also a fan of this more, quote unquote, realistic, as much as you can be in this franchise, grounded Lori as a survivalist who's totaled her relationships because that's probably what would actually happen if you have this sort of obsession. I think she delivers a fantastic performance. I'd like to also point out that this is the highest grossing film featuring a lead actress over the age of 65, which is wonderful. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's absolutely great. And we'll definitely get into the box office more here near the end. But suffice it to say, this film did well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. JD, what did you think about Laurie in this one? I liked it. I'm kind of split as to which canonical version I prefer as far as what happened to Laurie. I kind of like that this is one who's a little bit more proactive. The H2O version was somebody who kind of regressed and tried to hide and tried to do as much as she can to distance herself from Michael. And this is one who she says, like, I prayed every night he would escape so that way I can kill him. There's a validity to both of those versions. I think that this version is sometimes a little bit of a harder watch. It's supposed to be. It, you're like, feel sympathy for the family because she has withdrawn and become this crazy survivalist. It's an interesting take, and I think that Jamie Lee Curtis nails it. I mean, she is such a fantastic actress, and she's only gotten better. The big thing about this one is by being a sequel to just the first film, they've removed the brother-sister connection, mm -hmm. which is a huge thing because the whole familial connection defines so much of the franchise that we've had over the last 40 years. That's why I don't really want to pick between this and H2O in terms of that exploration of Laurie Strode. I lean towards H2O just because I think it's just a slightly tighter film. But I like having that dichotomy of H2O is the character study and climax of the Laurie who is Michael's sister. And this is the ultimate character study and climax of the Laurie who is not Michael's sister. One was being attacked by family that you didn't even know exist, and the other is being a random victim of some random murderer. There's similarities between the two, but there's also a lot of striking differences because they are two characters coming from two very different levels of victimdom. I don't know if that's the word, but they went through the same experience, but there was different context behind it. And so these are two different ways in which that character could have been explored. I'm kind of fine with that multiverse continuity. Oh, I'm totally fine. Again, I'm a Transformers fan. I'm used to 27 different timelines. <laughs> Alex, what did you think about this removing the brother-sister angle? I'm fine with it. I like Carpenter's original vision. Like I've always said, through Carpenter films, they always feel like just incidences more than traditional movie plots that you're kind of just dropped into the middle. You see how this plays out, then leave, and you don't need a bunch of lore or anything. I'm not a super huge fan. I guess I should explain the multiverse a bit better, that there's now Halloween that just keeps going. So it's Halloween, then Halloween 2, and then all the sequels and everything leading up to H2O, which is the finishing point for that, sort of. And then it goes into Halloween 8 with Laurie dying. Oh, wait, H2O gets rid of all the other sequels, doesn't it? Exactly. So you have your Halloween's 1 through 6 timeline. You have your Halloween's 1, 2, and H2O timeline. Mm -hmm. You have your Halloween's 1, 2, H2O, and 8 timeline. Because mm -hmm. H2O was meant to be both a finale, but also we have to make sure we can bring him back for part 8. Right. Then you have the zombie timeline, and then this is your new timeline of Halloween and Halloween. And then Halloween 3 could possibly exist as its own satellite pocket dimension as well. Exactly. Yeah, no, I enjoy this. I like jettisoning all that. I like the freedom of being able to do that. Yeah. I think it angers a lot of fans, but I think you should be in a world where you could be like, I like this, I don't like this, this is what I'm doing. So you don't have to be beholden, because I find a lot of times films, when they're struggling, cough, cough, X-Men franchise feeling like they have to hold on to that when they should just be able to do whatever they want and make the film they want to make. JD, what do you think about the whole removal of the family dynamic? It doesn't bother me, to be honest. They included that in the trailer. So like when I sat down, I already knew this was going to be just based off the first film. I think that was a really smart decision to include that early. So that way I had time to already process it. I had kind of moved on. And I was like, okay, this is going to be Halloween 2, even though it's just called Halloween. 
I didn't mind it. I think there is something really interesting about that first film because there isn't a reason given as to why Michael is doing what he's doing. He's just a psychopath. He's just an insane serial killer. And we don't get the whole familial relationship or anything like that. It's just a scary thing that happens that could have happened to anybody. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be related to a psychopath to encounter one. Yeah. Shifting over to Michael. Alex, what did you think about the portrayal of Michael in this film? I thought it was good. I thought it was definitely not exactly like the original Michael Myers. There's still the superhuman aspect of Michael that they've included in this that I don't think people can disassociate with. Like once Jason Voorhees, at a certain point, he just became the Terminator. And that's what people associate with, even if they try to do a more, quote unquote, grounded take he's still going to have that aspect to him. So I think this Michael is like that, where he is laser focused and very strong, even though he's like 80 years old now. That's just the way it is. There's obviously the supernatural element that they hint at that is always kind of just hang around him. I think they said his age was 66. Uh oh. <laughs> I think the actor did a great job of portraying Michael. I mean, the body movements, the head tilts, they were pretty on point. I do agree it's a little weird that a 66-year-old guy can curb stomp a guy's head into the ground in one kick. Or kick out part of a police car. Yeah, especially since it looks like the most activity they get is to just wander around on a doggy chain in a courtyard. These like Linda Hamilton in T2, where it's like, seems super despondent, but then the moment you leave the room, chin up, chin up, chin up. <laughs> and that may be it. Maybe that's a deleted scene. They found a Tybo DVD in his room. But I wish we had seen a little less of his face. I can get shoot him from behind. You can kind of get, okay, he's an older man. You understand that. But they get really close to just filming him head on a few times. I don't like that. I prefer the mystery to be there. And I think they skirt around that a little bit too close for my taste. But other than that, I thought they did a really good job portraying him. Yeah, Alex, what did you think about the fact that we pretty much do see Michael's face? Oh, I've never had a problem with Michael's face. He's supposed to always just be some guy. That's kind of why it's so scary that you see this shape walking around. But there is just a regular guy in there. That is kind of a terrifying concept. It's one of those ones that's kind of all about how you do it. Honestly, my only thing was they kind of do that scarred up eye makeup on him. It was a little cartoony, but kind of understandable given how much eye trauma he suffered in the first movie. Yeah, I guess that was a nod to the closet incidents. At least one of those wire hangers made contact. Oh, yeah. I didn't mind it, though, because they still kept it fleeting. I mean, it was kind of like there's the horror film I really enjoyed, Joyride, where the killer is supposed to be a trucker that you only ever hear on the radio, but you do actually see the killer pretty clearly throughout chunks of the movie, but it's still like corner of your eye. You know, it's either slightly out of focus or slightly blocked or from an angle. The only one that really bothered me was when the podcasters were confronting him that they didn't go and stand in front of Michael if their intent is to get a reaction out of him. Right. I don't know why they stayed behind him, even though they're holding up things that he can't see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can still shoot from over to Michael's shoulder and see Aaron, the podcaster, holding the mask, and that would have been just as effective. Yeah, I never had a problem with the scene where his mask got pulled off in the first film, where you do see his face fully. People keep forgetting that one. Yeah. Or... We we had our issues with Tyler Maine in the Rob Zombie movies. I never really had a problem with the fact that he spent most of Halloween 2 unmasked. I had other problems with him. Mm -hmm. I didn't mind that because they made a device about it when he would put the mask on and take it off. I would have more of a problem if Michael spoke, but I kind of liked that he's just a guy and he's just this gristled old balding guy with a white beard. And for the majority of the film, both masked and unmasked, the character is played by James Jude Courtney, though they did bring back Nick Castle, director Nick Castle, the director of Last Starfighter, who played <laughs> Michael in the original film. Nick Castle does play him during the one scene where Laurie sees him up in the room where he turns out to be a reflection in the mirror. Mm -hmm. I thought it was kind of a nice throwback and then that they cast a stunt man who kind of matched that tall, lean build. Mm -hmm. I've never been a fan of a giant Michael. No. I like that there's a kind of lean quality to him. He's very fluid, has good posture. <laughs> I imagine like Michael Myers practicing in a cell with a book on his head just to get that posture right. I do think he's a little mechanical sometimes when he's walking around with the mask, but I like that he's still a Michael who's looking at things. He's looking around, taking in situations. I prefer a Michael that's more of a planner where he hangs back before suddenly pushing the first domino. But I kind of like that this Michael is definitely an opportunist who just kind of goes from opportunity to opportunity to opportunity and cashes in on every opportunity he gets. 
And that's kind of like in the original film. He just kind of wandered around until he sees this one girl fixates on her and then starts tearing apart everything around her. And in this one, it's like the first time I saw this film, I was a little thrown by the whole scene where he's just literally going from house to house to house killing people Mm -hmm. because that's a little unfocused for Michael. But, you know, if you think about it, the first house he goes to where he uses the hammer, that's where he gets the knife. And then he's like, hey, I got a knife. I got to use this knife. He goes to the next house and uses the knife. Mm -hmm. And then the next house where he kills Vicky, that's a little bit more of now that he's gotten that out of his system, he's going to look for something where he can plan more. But then that house is what leads him to see Lori again for the first time. And then he starts fixating on Lori. And then that path to Lori's place is what takes him across all the other victims. Do you think it's a detriment to the film that a relatively key moment like that is more or less luck? The fact that he goes to Lori's granddaughter's best friend, the house that she's babysitting in, that seems a little convenient. I know people are very dismissive of coincidence and chance in movies, but there's ways in which you can do it well. I don't mind because in Michael's perspective, there's no tie between Vicky and Allison and Lori. Mm -hmm. They're all three separate entities. I don't think he knows that Lori has any relationship to Allison when he's going after her. It's just he happened to be crossing the path as these teenagers at the same time. And what I also like is when he's going from house to house, there's that one couple that are at their car where the guy loses his keys, where it's like, oh, Michael's totally going to kill this couple until the opportunity passes him by. Mm -hmm. Because that's how Michael met Lori in the first movie, by pure chance. Mm -hmm. You know, when she went to put the keys under the mat of the house that he happened to be hiding in and he sees her. And then he starts following her around. I don't mind chances, but there can be a degree of a lot of chances. And again, it's not that he went like straight to Vicky. It's he's kind of going house to house and it leads into, I mean, God, who knows? He might have cleaned out like five, six, seven houses of people. That's true. I'm kind of glad he didn't kill the baby. Yeah. I almost thought he was going to because this is a film where we've already established that he doesn't mind killing kids. Yeah. But I can kind of see in Michael's mind that would be an opportunity of just kind of fucking with someone by, I left your mother dead in the kitchen and that kid's (laughs) going to have to grow up with that now. That's sick and twisted and something that Michael would do. What did you think of the sequence where the kid and his father come across the bus where Michael has escaped? I kind of liked it for, if nothing else, I just appreciated that it had a child who, they never express his sexuality, but the fact that he's doing a very traditionally effeminate thing, he's talking about wanting to be in dance, and that's what he's mainly concerned about. He's like, yeah, dad, we'll go out hunting and fishing on the, on the weekends, but really I want to focus in on my dancing. I thought that was really progressive and cool. I thought the scene itself was nicely tense and you didn't know how safe the kid was. I thought he was probably about as safe as anyone could be. And then to have him get killed, I was a little surprised when I first saw that. I kind of like that the surprise of the death comes after the almost comic relief moment of him accidentally shooting Sartain and being like, oh, fuck. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm usually on record. I don't enjoy children or pets being killed in movies. I have young children myself, and that creeped up on me that I no longer can handle that. So the baby scene was a bit nerve-wracking for me, but I knew in my heart that they wouldn't go there because that would be really, especially with the way that they're shooting it and kind of that long shot, it would be too grisly. Yeah. But with the boy, I will say I enjoy that this film, unlike every other Halloween sequel, I don't want these people to die, and I'm very sad that they die, and I'm kind of glad that they do that, because people being murdered is horrible and not fun, and these people have all their hopes and dreams and their lives and everything like that, and I think like the original Halloween, which a lot of slashers don't get, is we get a little glimpse into their lives and their candid conversations and their little quirks and idiosyncrasies, and it's really hard to watch them get killed, so I appreciate that. I agree with that, too. And that's kind of what I liked about that sequence. And also, like, even when the stoner teenagers are dying, it's like the film always gives the victim a moment, at Mm -hmm. least a moment Mm -hmm. that makes it so that it still hurts when they die, even if you don't really like the character that much. I mean, getting to Vicky and Dave, I thought Vicky was great. She's kind of snarky and dirty and wants to have sex with her boyfriend and smoke pot. But she's also really good at how she connects with the kid. Mm -hmm. It helps that that kid is funny as hell Mm -hmm. with his toenail clipping and (laughs) stuff. (laughs) And then Dave is pretty much worthless, but he still gets that moment where she's in danger and he grabs a knife and goes to save her. Mm -hmm. He doesn't succeed at it, but the moment the chips fell, he took action. Yeah. A character you totally expected to not take action. Yeah, Yeah. they didn't do the horror trope of making all the teenage characters completely unlikable, which is something that we had talked about in the last Jadokrafer we had done, where a lot of these kids are often just written as so annoying in all these horror films. I always appreciate it when we get, okay, they're not being total shits. 
Actually, the worst one is the one that doesn't die. Yeah, Cameron. I mean, like the whole Vicky Dave sequence, it could have just been, you know, Linda and her boyfriend all over again, Mm -hmm. but that they really made Vicky a really fun character. They showed this really good connection with the kid. They cast the kid really well and that they Mm -hmm. gave Dave a genuine moment. Oh, that was great. I'm a big fan of Vicky. I think she's awesome. Yeah, I like that she was very human. She got the moments with Julie and the kid that they were snipping at each other, which was very funny because Julian is probably the best character in the whole movie. No, don't you go up. Send Dave first. Exactly. <laughs> I'm just like, yes, that is exactly what you should do because he really cares about Vicky. I was very sad that Vicky died, but also glad that they made a character that I would be sad that died. Yeah, I mean, that even when we come back to that crime scene that, you know, one of the first things that we see is just the dead face of Vicky and Hawkins staring down at it. It's a sadness to death. I mean, I know there's the whole big thing about slasher films of make all the victims as horrible of people as you can so that you know mm-hmm. the audience will cheer when they get killed. I get that to a degree, but without any emotional connection to actually play on the fact that, you know, you're still watching people die. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's treating it like a horror. That's the suspense of, I don't want this character to die. Oh, dear God, they just died. Mm-hmm. I prefer films that do that. JD, you and I got into that with the two deaths of Annie in the zombie films, which I think are probably the pinnacle of painful death. Yeah. I always appreciate it when you care about the kids. That's the biggest thing that I think we struggled with a lot of the poorer sequels, like five and six, or a lot of the unproduced scripts that we've read, where it's just you don't care about the kids. It's such the trope of let's get together with beers and weed and we'll have our own Halloween party. It's like that's always the setup. Yeah. And it's nice when a film, even if you're still going to do that setup, that you kind of just go a little bit above and beyond in making actual characters. Again, we have that in H2O, too, where it's like, yeah, we're going to get together for our own Halloween party for beers and weed. And yet they still humanize the kids in ways that you cared about them and it felt bad when they died. Absolutely. And then, yeah, kind of moving on to the other teenagers. I mean, yeah, it was interesting. Cameron, that once he had his big breakup with Allison, never saw him again. Yeah, there's a deleted scene on the Blu-ray that explains where he is. After Allison leaves the dance, Cameron chases after her, gives her back her phone. He says, oh, just put it in some rice. It'll be okay. But then the sheriff's deputies say, like, we're calling a curfew on the town. You need to get inside. Cameron's obviously still drunk and he gets belligerent with them and they arrest him because he was trying to apologize to her. And it was actually a moment that gave him a little bit more character. I kind of wish it was there. And it also would explain where he's at, considering he was so key to the first half of the film. On one hand, you're like, okay, he's trying to make an effort. He's not very good at it, but he's still awkward and trying to blame the girl for kissing him and all this. And then he gets lippy with the cops and gets arrested. There were the bit moments where they mentioned his family and, you know, especially Ray saying like, yeah, your dad used to sell me peyote and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Did you catch the name of his dad? Uh, I did not. Lonnie. Oh. He's the kid of one of the three bullies who teased Tommy in the first movie. Amazing. Interesting. That makes sense. It's a small town, so. Alex, what did you think about that whole turn? The heel turn was very abrupt, but also very realistic from my limited dating experience in high school, where everyone can sort of turn on you in a drop of a hat. Yeah. But his main objective through the entire movie is basically just to remove her communication device. And I'm just like, what party is this where they have pudding? (laughs) Like a blancmange or whatever. It was a cheese dip for nachos. Was that cheese dip? Yeah. According to the script. Okay, that looked like a pudding. I'm just like, why not a punch? That would eliminate the phone so much easier. Cheese can't get in as easy as a fruit punch. Yeah. But whatever. Yeah, I thought he was fine. He looked like a little geek ledger wannabe. Yeah, (laughs) I had no problem with it. Yeah, I mean, he was kind of charming at first, and I did like the whole spin on Bonnie and Clyde. Yeah. Yes. I did read a draft of the screenplay. It was pretty much the finished film. It just had some of the deleted scenes, and then they redid the third act. The whole story with the girl was just, she was a girl who had the hots for him and thought that Allison wasn't good enough for him, and so she kept hitting on him at every turn. Mm. To a degree, yeah, he was telling the truth that, you know, he was just talking to her and she's the one who initiated the kiss, but the belligerent way he was trying to backtrack from everything. Oh, sure. That was really shitty, and then just tossing the phone was like, dude, you're just digging yourself deeper and deeper here. Yeah. Yeah, I wish they had maybe set up. A lot of teenagers nowadays, they want to pay attention to their phone. I could see like a boyfriend who wants her to pay attention to him being annoyed by that, but they don't really set that up well. No. And there are people like this who they get some drinks in them and their personality flips and they become complete douchebags. I think he's probably a bad fit for Allison, but I think it's a very true to that age thing. Yeah, he's a douche, but I did actually like him for the first half of the film that he was in. Then he just heel turn and then disappears. 
I'm actually kind of refreshed that he didn't suddenly like, you know, as he's stumbling home drunk, gets killed by Michael. I find that refreshing that, yeah, now he's just a character who's just going to like wake up the next day and find out that pretty much everyone in his life has been brutally butchered. Yeah, it would be a little too neat if he was killed. Yeah. A little too yeah. sleep away camp if he was just immediately punished. Exactly. Unless they do like a sequel that picks up later that night where it's like they think he's Michael and they run him over and then it's like recreate that whole <laughs> Halloween 2 thing. <laughs> and then what did you all think of Oscar, the sleazy best friend? I was going to say he was another douche turn, but I think he was kind of a douche from the beginning. I considered him my third derailing character of the three derailing characters in this movie. I know what he was trying to do. I know what his character is supposed to be. I don't think he was largely successful. I don't think that usually is a successful role of the quirky, crazy best friend that doesn't fit with usually a jock. I'm not sure what yeah. this guy was. I think in 2018, you're kind of just more of a hip guy than a jock these days. Yeah, I think he was par for the course. Like, it was also neat for him to die, but he gave us a great scene with the lights going on and off in his drunkenness. I thought that was a really cool scene. His drunken monologue to Michael Myers. That was a good touch. Yeah. I think I'd like it more if he was in love with the boyfriend than with Allison. I think that would have been a nicer touch. Oh, I kind of like that. Yeah. yeah. He was fine. He's probably the one who's the most disposable out of the main cast. He feels like a fifth wheel. I think the actor actually does a pretty good job. I've known those obnoxious guys. I've known people who drunkenly think, oh, I can make a move here and don't realize how awkward and not good that is. But it really wasn't necessary to the story. I do think his kill is actually pretty well done. I, I really like the motion sensor lights. It's just a nice, creepy thing that felt true to the original Halloween, but still updating it in a new and an innovative way. But the character itself, he probably could have been cut out of the film, and I don't think you would have missed much. I think it's interesting that they basically have him die in the place where Cameron would typically die. Mm -hmm. Story-wise, you needed to have the death that makes Allison realize she's in danger. Right. If it wasn't going to be him, it was going to be Cameron. And I thought it was kind of refreshing that we didn't need the whole nice guy turn where he makes a move on her. Yeah. But if you were interested in Cameron, then, hey, now we're killing the gay character in the film. Yeah, yeah that's true. I just thought they would have had better conversations yeah. than him trying to hit on her. Yeah, it's one of those things where I'm frustrated by what led us into the scene where he's left on his own, but I really, really like the scene where he's on his own. Mm -hmm. And again, yeah, that he's just this drunk kid, just the absolute pits pouring to the one guy who's standing nearby like, man, I'm sorry, I, I don't mean it. I'm just, this is just not knowing that that's Michael Myers. I yeah. almost thought it would have been amusing if Michael had just been kind of like, well, fuck it, and walked away. Because we've seen Michael do that before. It's true. Like, especially remember in Halloween 8 where he encountered Busta Rhymes dressed as Michael Myers, and he just turns and walks away from it. And just being like, well, I'm going to just see what happens. <laughs> And yeah, the use of the motion sensor lights where it's Michael will just stand still and stare at you. And as you're standing still staring at him, not knowing what's going to happen, that's when the lights turn off and he makes his move. It's a really clever sequence there. So kind of circling back around to the Strodes, Alex, what did you think about Allison? I liked her. I thought she did a great job. I would like to have flipped the amount of time she was in the movie with Judy Greer, personally. Mm -hmm. I would like to have explored the mother-daughter relationship more than the mother-grandmother relationship, but that is not what we got, and I think she did a great job. She was very good in the intense scenes. She was very good in the not tense scenes, so thumbs up to her. I liked her a lot. I think she did a great job. She felt like a nice update to the Laurie Strode of the original film. That young girl who's not entirely innocent, but a mostly nice girl who is just trying to live her life and gets caught up in this terrible thing. I like the fact that she's reaching out to her grandmother and all that, and she calls her grandmother. There's something quaint about using such an older term rather than grandma. I think that she's a charming character and actress, and she looks really cute in that costume. It's just very charming to see somebody dressed like that. And it's something we really haven't seen that often is somebody actually in costume in a Halloween film. Not since Jamie spent the entire second half in the clown costume in part four. Yeah, that's not something we've seen much of. And I thought that was actually kind of an interesting take. I mean, admittedly, they're street clothes. It's stuff that wouldn't look terribly out of place. Well, I mean, it's still the period Clyde right. outfit of dress pants, dress shirt, dress shoes and suspenders, which is still just slightly different enough that it had an interesting look to it. Yeah. You know what was missing, though? 
a bit where Michael reaches to grab her and gets the suspenders and she unclips the suspenders to run away. Hmm. You got that little extra costume touch there. That's something you could build a nice little moment around. Yeah. I thought the actress did a really nice job. Yeah, Andy Medichak, I know there were actually quite a few young stars who were lobbying for this role. Quite a few people who wanted to be like Emma Roberts wanted to be in it, Mm -hmm. but they intentionally wanted to get an unknown who didn't really have much film experience. I thought she did a really nice job of settling in as the new Laurie. Not quite as iconic as Jamie was in that original film, but she did a really good job. She had a good look, good physicality to her. She handled the drama well, the comedy, the whole scene with Cameron was really well done. I really liked her. She was a really good performance. I look forward to seeing more of her career. And then the mother played by Judy Greer, Karen. I love Judy Greer. I was like, oh, this is the route they're going to go with her because she's this concerned mom for almost the entire movie. And I was actually really impressed, especially towards the end when she's able to flip it and have that great scene where she's like, I can't do it. I can't do it. And you see Michael coming in and she's like, gotcha, and shoots him dead on. I was like, that justified her entire performance for the whole movie. And not that I didn't like it. I think she felt like a realistic mother who's trying to move on from her mother's insane survivalist training stuff. But that's still a part of her history and be able to use those skills for something that she thought she would never have to. I think that was a really great turn. And I really kind of wish we had gotten more of her in this film, to be honest. I agree more. I would have liked more of her. I felt that the gotcha moment was great, but it could have been more great. The first time I watched it, I didn't even remember. She said gotcha in the flashback because that's all you really get to showcase her experiences with her mother in the survivalist camp. Mm -hmm. I just would have liked a bit more time with her, but I never have any problems with Judy Greer. I have a lot of mixed feelings about this character. I think it's a good character. I like the whole struggles with the way in which she was raised, the way in which she feels that she's finally escaped that way that she was raised and wanting her daughter to not have any contact with that while also now being faced with, but your mother's worst fear that she's been preparing for is actually happening. I don't think we get enough of that emotional settling of that. She spends most of the third act just in a huff. You just, oh no, what's happening? What's going on? What's that? What's that? You know, <clears throat> Which I know is all set up for the big turn when she finally reveals that she's got Michael dead in her sights. But I feel like we don't get that connection between her and her mom where, despite it still not being a great way to raise a kid, that she understands it now, that she understands what it was all for. You know, we never really get that full connection. Even the whole bit where it's like she gets to the door leading into the basement for the first time and Ray is like, what's down there? And she's like, my childhood. It just doesn't feel like that moment fully sells. It wasn't until the second time that I've really realized the full impact of that line. (laughs) And there's something about just the way in which it was filmed that it just didn't fully deliver that. Even though we got those nice little momentary flashbacks, like I even noticed during the flashback, you have this whole bit where she was helping to install those shutters that come down on each of the doorways. Mm -hmm. And the moment the first one drops, we cut to her where she suddenly has this reaction of recognition, realizing what's going Mm -hmm. on. But I still wanted more of an actual emotional moment between her and her mother that I think we don't quite get because of the momentum of that third act. Yeah. Because I still think one of the most powerful human moments of the franchise has still been that moment between Lori and H2O, where she has the boyfriend who came over for a booty call, but she ends up opening up to him about who she is, what she's been through, and why she drinks. Mm -hmm. That is still one of the best moments of the franchise. We still don't really have a human moment in this one that fully hits that level. We have a few moments that are almost there, but I think that's the one thing that keeps me from loving this one as much as H2O is it doesn't go as far as it can in the character stuff. Mm -hmm. It touches on a lot of it, but it just doesn't dig deeply enough into it. And also, what would you have thought had they cast that as Daniel Harris? Hmm. To have a universe where she was never separated from her daughter. You'd have to age her up because Danielle Harris still looks like she's 20-something. Even though she's in her 40s. Yeah. I think you could have done that. My inclination is to say when you get a chance for more Judy Greer, you always go for more Judy Greer. But I think Danielle Harris would have been a nice nod to that. But I can see it would be a little confusing to some people. Coming so on the heels of the zombie films, which brought back Daniel Harris. Right. And plus, would you have her play as Jamie Strode? Or would you have her play as Karen, this other alternate universe where she had a daughter, but they grew up as a family, even if it was a messed up family? 
I don't really have much thoughts on the matter. I'm not a really huge fan of four through six, so I'm okay with casting actors. I mean, I thought Daniel Harris was the best part of four through six, but I do think the zombie films, I love the character study that was the second film. So I thought that was a really nice way of bringing her back into the franchise and giving her a nice, not really a nice send off, but a powerful send off. I bring it up because Daniel Harris was actively lobbying for the role. Like, she was Mm -hmm. really pushing hard, like, please, can we do a film where we actually get to have Jamie and Laurie together? I think that would have been interesting. The only thing is that if she hadn't been in the zombie films, I think that would have been an easier sell. But seeing as the zombie films are literally the most recent Halloween films we had before this and are something that the franchise is actively trying to move away from, Mm -hmm. I understand them not wanting to have any ties to that. Yeah. It's one of those conflicting things. I think Judy Greer does a really good job. I like the character as is. On the other hand, I kind of would have loved to have seen a universe where Laurie and Jamie were never separated. Yeah. But I get why they didn't do that. Yeah. It would have been a neat little thing for fans, but I don't know if it would really have actually made the film better. Here's the thing. If we're going to continue doing timeline reboots, I would love to see Daniel Harris come back in a basically, here's a brand new sequel to Halloween 5. Or even a brand new sequel to Halloween 4. Yeah. I like the character of Jamie. I like Daniel Harris. I didn't love those films that much, but I like that role and I would love to see a better ending for that character than what we got with 6 and even kind of 5. Well, and I think there's a contingency of Halloween fans who that was their Halloween growing up. There are people who would react well for that. It wouldn't compare to obviously as bringing Jamie Lee Curtis back. I think whatever gets to the point where we're spitting out sequels again, I would actually be way more interested in bringing Daniel Harris back than seeing Michael Myers kills another group of teenagers. So Alex, what did you think of Ray? He was my second derailing character. I thought he was okay, but he was a little goofy, but I see what they were going for, but he didn't really land any of his jokes or anything. And no one really cared when he died. <laughs> yeah. That was my big problem is he dies and nobody gets to really react to that. And I understand, like, this is a female empowerment film. The three main leads are all female. Ray felt added on. But if your father, your son-in-law and your husband died, there should be some reaction from these. I don't even know if Allison knows her father's dead by the end of the movie. In the original ending, his body was still out front and she came across it. That was part of the reshoots that got changed. Hmm. But yeah, I mean, what if that whole thing where Judy Greer is waiting, laying a trap down at the basement? That's when Michael, instead of rounding the corner, puts the body of Ray around the corner. And suddenly she's got her dead husband in the sights of her gun. I prefer the more empowering scene that we got, but I I think there should have been something. They have all these cameras. They should have had her see this happening and react or something. Like They could have done something more. Even that he's such a hopeless schmuck that we have this secure place, everything's all locked and shuttered, and then he just opens it all up and walks outside with the door still open. Yeah. Ray was a schmuck. I like that they cast a comedic actor. I thought the actor was fun. I did like some bits like, oh, man, I got peanut butter on my penis. (laughs) But yeah, he was kind of a worthless schmuck and you never got a human connection with the family. Yeah. Some of the comedy in this film, while it's entertaining comedy, doesn't really help the scene. Like, again, the scene where Vicky's dying is a very shocking scene. And yet they're still putting in jokes of Julian going like, nope. Yeah. There's places to put the comedy and there's places to not. Mm -hmm. Ray being such a schmuck really did feel out of place, especially during that scene where he dies. Like, you know that this is serious. Like, the police have taken you here. They are guarding you and you're playing yo-yo and doing all these little shtick things. I'm like, you're a grown-ass adult. You know when things are serious. You're a father. You're going to be concerned. Like, if he had been more panicked when he went out and saw the deputy's car drive up, maybe you could justify, like, why he's going out there. Mm -hmm. But he's just strolling up like, hey, any word yet? Show a little bit of extra concern. And it's just not there in the performance, which I think comes down more to the direction than the actor. I think they wanted him to be a comic foil. Speaking of misplaced comedy, Alex, what did you think of Dr. Sartain? (laughs) I thought Dr. Sartain landed his jokes, but he also (laughs) shouldn't have been making them in the beginning. What do you mean, sit still? I am sitting still. Exactly. (laughs) He had a nice dry sense of humor to him, but his character was, oh, he was my number one derailing character. (laughs) Even his heel turn, I'm just like, what is going on with your magical razor pen or whatever? Yeah, I didn't really care for Sartain. 
the movie does tend to get a little referential and too reverential towards the original. I liked that it did an inverse of everything. I thought mm-hmm. that was a cool aspect. But referring to Michael as the shape, the power of Halloween, even in the beginning with this mask, it's power. You feel it. It's part of you. And I'm like, well, why isn't the butcher knife then part of him? Does he feel that way every time he sees Star Trek? Yeah. Or mechanics <laughs> overall should be a big part of it. So Sartain was like, as the new Loomis, as Jamie puts it, it was more powerful hearing archival footage of Loomis than Sartain's entire performance. (laughs) First off, there's somebody actually credited as the voice of Loomis. It's a good impression. That's the one thing they did better than H2O was their Loomis impersonation. (laughs) Yeah. I thought Sartain, to be honest, I really didn't think too much of him to begin with. And then by the time he does his heel turn, I was like, oh, that seems kind of out of nowhere. There's like a scene on the Blu-ray where you get a little bit more of a, okay, there's something not quite right about him because he's asking Frank, the deputy, do you wear women's panties? And he's like picking his nose and he said, I'm scratching my brain from in here and stuff like that. That was not in the script that I read. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that must have been an ad lib bit. It may have been. I think it was supposed to show like, OK, there's something a little bit off about him. So that way, when he stabs Frank, it's less out of nowhere. But I think they decided to like go for the surprise more than building up his character. To be honest, most of the time, he's just a warmed over, leftover version of Loomis that doesn't ever click as well as Loomis because he's not given any time to really expand his character. any. The thing is, by having him be the new Loomis, he's almost a parody of Loomis. Because they play him a little broadly and a little silly and a little bumbling. But then the whole subversion where it's like, what if Loomis became so obsessed with the killer that he actually tried to become a copycat killer? Is not a bad plot, but it's not the right fit for this movie. It's a little too broad. Mm -hmm. And I already saw that plot in National Lampoon's Class Reunion from 1980, written by John Hughes, one of the first parodies of slasher films, where there is a (laughs) full-on Donald Pleasance impersonating Loomis character who ends up being the killer. It's not really clever of a subversion. You don't really need a new Loomis when technically your podcasters are already your new Loomis and you're already subverting the concept by killing them in the first act. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It doesn't work. I get what they're going for, but I think it was tonally misjudged as a piece of this movie. I mean, you want to have a doctor at the facility that we meet in the very beginning. That's fine. You could have pulled Sartain out of the entire rest of the movie and just have it be that Hawkins, when he's trying to take out Michael, ends up getting killed by Michael. Mm -hmm. The whole thing of him putting on Michael's mask and then putting Michael in the backseat of the cruiser with Allison and then that whole sequence and then getting his face curb stomped. It's so broad. Yeah. It's so silly. Yeah, I really hated the scene where he's wearing Michael's mask. It felt like they were trying to make the audience go, what? And then he just takes it off and throws it in the back seat. Right. Instead of keep wearing it. And that should have been why Michael got so pissed off that he killed Sartain is he wants his fucking mask back. Right. And plus the whole, I need to know more about him, so I'm going to act like him. I just don't buy that. It felt very much like Hollywood understanding of psychology that doesn't actually line up with actual mental health care. Yeah. I would have been more fine with it if he just didn't say anything. If he just cut out like, what does it feel like to kill somebody? I'm like, that feels very forced and juvenile. If he just started doing things, I would have bought it a bit more instead of trying to explain it because you can't explain it in a satisfactory manner. Yeah. Show don't tell. Yeah. And then also like, again, Michael being so superhuman that he can kick out the gay of a sheriff's car with one kick and then flatten a guy's head with one kick. Yeah. Even Tyler Maine took three tries. That's true. That would have to be a lot of PCP to do that. Yeah. (laughs) Kind of rounding out our cast, the other big one was Will Patton as Officer Hawkins, our Sheriff Brackett fill-in. For a second, I actually thought, is this somebody from the first film that I completely blanked out on because they talked about how he was there that night, but I guess he just meant that he was part of the team that arrested Michael. I thought he was fine. I really like the scene where he's working with Lori. He knows her and understands what she's going through. They act like they may have had like a history, like they're yelling at each other, but he's never upset that she's there. But then after that, he's mainly just a device to get Michael and Allison close to Lori's place, along with Sartain. He's fine. I wish he'd either gotten a little bit more development or maybe had been taken out, because I'm not sure if he really serves a whole lot of purpose. 
He was fine. He was basically just a foil for Lori, someone to talk to so she could utter her warnings and whatnot against Michael. And I told you so, and he did his job admirably, but there's not really too much to talk about. Yeah, I mean, he's a perfectly fine, stoic, duty-bound officer. I like the relationship with Lori where he's just, will you please go home, even though he knows she's not going to go home. But yeah, then the whole Sartain incident just instantly removes him from the story. Pretty much, yeah. I thought there'd be more to him. I did like the sheriff in his big Stetson, you know, being like, oh, what, you want us to cancel Halloween? I love that guy. (laughs) (laughs) And like two scenes later, well, I guess we're canceling Halloween. (laughs) Yes, gotta go. (laughs) I like the other two cops who are talking about the sandwiches. And I did like the visual of the police cruiser that just kind of rolls down the street until it crashes in front of the house. And then you find that one guy has been stabbed through the throat and the other guy's head is in his lap as a jack-o'-lantern. Yeah. Yeah. I wish we had gotten a few more tableau kills. Like, we've talked about that in the various John Ockerfuss we've done, where we like a little bit of a show. He likes to display. Yeah, that's the only one we really get that's like that. Well, he's older now. He doesn't have the time to put into things anymore. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's good enough. He puts a sheet over Vicky and stuff, but nothing that's to that display of the original Halloween. And then, Alex, we still haven't talked about the podcasting couple. <laughs> I do like that podcast. We're one of the inciting enemies of this entire movie. Award-winning their, true crime podcasters. Which is basically them just yelling at Michael, say something! Like, that's scintillating podcasting right there. And then going off and making a victim of multiple murders, a survivor, super upset by being like, you should talk to this guy. No, she shouldn't. Neither should you. What did you think about when your child was pried away from you? Yeah, I felt good, man. Thanks. Yeah. I like that it was baby Kenneth Branagh. (laughs) Yeah, they were just a little bit ridiculous. I would have liked if they were a bit more like serial, trying to be prying, but a little more subtle about it instead of, I don't know. Half the time I'm just like, why are you even seeing him in the yard? Why don't you see him in his cell where he can actually look at you and he's not facing the other direction? Why can't you walk around the square to look at him from the other side? And the whole mental institution was so cartoonish in the first place. And like really listening to classical music on like a record player. While in a very giant chessboard field. Exactly. Where everyone is acting like the depiction of the mentally ill from like the 1970s. Well, and they even talk about how they're transferring him to a maximum facility, but then where they're going through the victims on the bus, they say, yeah, we managed to round everyone up. Most of them were just minimum offenders. And it's like, why are they going to a maximum facility? I know. (laughs) With Michael. Yeah. I really did not like the way they portrayed the mentally ill in this. All of them were treated basically like animals. Yep. All of a sudden, like, Michael doesn't react, but there's something supernatural going on because all the other guys start freaking out because of his lack of reaction to the mask. Plus being bound by chains in a courtyard. Yeah, that's like 1960s level mental health care. Well, and they also talked about how when you guys arrived, he was going from window to window observing you. And it's like, how is he going from window to window when everyone is being shuffled from cell to cell in chains? Yeah. But as far as the podcasters go, you guys podcast more than me. Noel, you've got like $3,000 to just throw around to guests, right? Well, after that one expose I did, won a bunch of awards, I was able to pawn (laughs) off the award, (laughs) smelt it down. They're treating them like they're journalists, but they're just crime podcasters, which there is some crossover. Obviously, like crime podcasts are really big, but I just can't see them, A, having the money to just fly to America. And it's not like it's a mystery that they need to solve. Right. (laughs) It feels like somebody who had somebody describe a true podcast to the writers and they never actually listened to one. (laughs) The overwrought narration the yelling at the victim and the murderer. It feels gross. It's tabloid. Yeah. Yet Aaron says, oh, we're journalists. We shouldn't pay for our interviews. But then he doesn't have any journalistic integrity. Apparently, he calls in a favor from the attorney general's office to get the mask. But then they just toss in the trunk. Evidence yeah. is not a library. You can't borrow that. By the way, there was a cutscene from the script where when they're in their hotel room, he puts on the mask and they have sex in the shower. Yeah, oh they filmed God. that one. It's on the Blu-ray. <laughs> oh, boy. It's dumb. I yeah. can understand why they deleted that scene. It serves no purpose. Yeah, that's like a Halloween 8 scene. I really like the actors. I think their yeah, performances yeah. were good. I thought the scene in the bathroom where they're attacked it was well done. Yeah, the whole thing with the teeth, that was really unnerving. That's a Michael messing with people, yeah. Yeah. 
But even then, like thinking back to H2O, H2O also had the rest stop bathroom sequence with the mother and daughter who neither one of them actually got killed. And yet it was a scarier sequence than when these two podcasters get killed. That's true. Mm -hmm. And it was just because Michael wanted to steal a purse so he could get car keys. They're kind of having their cake and eating it too. They're kind of going back to classic Michael, but they're still also doing the sequels, Michael, of he kills everybody he comes across. Mm. Everybody. Yeah. I think the podcaster couple are, are ones, that, like if you drop Sartain from the plot, you could have involved them a little more throughout the story. Yeah, they could have been the new Loomis. It's an interesting intro to the story, but it's still an awkward scene. Like the whole opening sequence is undone for me by the whole thing. If you're trying to show something to a person when you can just literally walk around and face them from the front. Mm -hmm. That whole staging just really bugs me. And again, this gets into my problems with the third act is the whole Lori going through her house is just tactically very poorly staged for someone who's supposed to be obsessed with tactics and survivalism and all that stuff. You wouldn't go to the closet and open the doors. You'd just shoot both doors. Yeah, the whole house doesn't make a lot of sense. You should be living in like an open concept house. Michael Myers should open like a closet and there should be no closet there. It should be just like the same wall yeah. or something like that. That would have been funny. I mean, I like the idea of the shutters that basically like seal off each room as she clears it. It's very Alien 3. I did enjoy that. But then she gets to the one room where not only is the porch door open, which should not be able to open on a secure house... But she has all the mannequins piled in the corner and a closet in the one. It's just... Designed specifically for a scare involving a white-faced killer. Like, there's yeah. nothing that those mannequins are there for. And I love that she turns on the floodlights outside, but turns off all the lights inside. And it's like, you know what would be a good tactic? Is if all of the lights on the inside were on batteries, so you could not cut the power to the house. They would all have their own independent power source. So you would have mm. lights on all the time, and the killer can't hide in the shadows. Yeah. And then there was way too much of, let's go into the basement, now let's come out of the basement. Now let's go into the basement. That basement door opened and shut, I want to say four or five times yeah. in that third act. Getting into the basement and sealing that door should be a giant act unto itself, but they keep sealing it and then coming out and then sealing it and then coming out. And I know a lot of that third act was hastily assembled in reshoots. And their original third act, she had the encounter with Michael where he grabbed her through the door, which, first of all, why does she have glass? Yeah, it doesn't. And not like plexiglass or something like that. Well, I get it to the point where it's a trap. Yeah. Like they want him in there. I know. But again. But even that whole trap was added in reshoots. Oh, was it? The whole basement room ultimately didn't mean anything in the original ending. In the original ending, after she has that incident at the door, then her and Michael actually go out on the front yard where Allison is over the body of her dead father. And then Lori and Michael have a knife fight where he wins and is basically cutting down Lori. And then that's when Karen appears at the front door with a crossbow that she fires through his chest. Mother, daughter, granddaughter all run off to the road where they flag down the truck and Michael stumbles out to the field of mannequins where he kind of drops to his knees and we don't know, is he dying? Is he resting? What? And we cut the black. Oh, interesting. I prefer the theatrical version. I do prefer the theatrical version. I still don't think it's staged. And again, not to keep comparing this to H2O, but the confrontation between Laurie and Michael in H2O was just this great long sequence with the fire axe and him coming down from the pipes on the ceiling and the whole bit of her hiding under the tables, not realizing he's on top of the tables. That whole great scene where the two teenagers are trapped behind the gate where he's swinging his knife through it and they drop the keys. And it's a question of, is he going to get to the keys first or are they going to get to the keys first ending with that whole moment where him and Lori are on the opposite sides of a door window looking at each other for the first time and then the whole climax where she beheads him that was just such an incredibly staged third act mm -hmm. that was the perfect culmination of victim and killer now having their final showdown and this one, it's just a lot of wandering around and then Michael springing from shadows. Mm. It just didn't work for me. I do like the moment of Judy Greer doing her whole gotcha moments. I don't mind the whole bit of once they push him into the basement, they then seal him in the basement and burn the house down. Mm -hmm. I don't mind that stuff. That stuff is good. The last three minutes are good. Yeah. I just thought practically it all worked because it was the whole setting up as a cage versus trap thing. Yeah. I thought that was a nice payoff. Yeah, I just didn't like the way it was all staged. 
It just wasn't suspenseful to me. It was just kind of like, don't open the door. Don't open the door. Yeah, I don't think David Gordon Green has got a lot of strength in the coiled suspense sort of thing. There were some scenes where he did some good suspense. He's good at shock. He is really good at shock. Like, I mean, the whole Vicky scene is not really suspenseful, but it has the good shock of, you know, the closet won't shut. Oh, the closet door is great. And then opening the door and just casually he's there, you know? Yeah. I wish they didn't spoil that in the trailer. God, yeah. Oh, the score. The score. Oh, yeah. By John Carpenter, his son and his godson. Uh, JD, what do you think about the score? I loved it. You have the classic music that they've remixed, but there's one that sounds like a guitar growl. Yeah, that very deep guitar. And then the making of, you see they had like a violin bow and they used it on an electric Ooh. guitar to get that effect. That's probably my favorite track that's new to this film. I just love it because it's got that growly feel. Like I could listen to that song on repeat for a while. It's a really good score. Oh, it's a banger. I love the score. Absolutely no problems with it. Trent Reznor and his score writing partner, Radicus Ross, they did a remix of the original Halloween theme, which is actually excellent. I was mm. expecting it to go in that direction for the new score, but they kind of did it both ways, where it's very synthy, very minimalist, but they have some orchestral flourishes. Mm. And like you said, the guitar effects with the bow of the violin, and I just thought it was great. It was top notch. It was wonderful to hear a score of that caliber for a Halloween film, which is like the first time I've really heard one. I think the H2O symphonic version was really good as well, but this is probably on par or maybe a little bit below the original. I like the H2O score after they did the remix because the first one was a little Danny elfman mm. but it's still a good score. This was a great score because I've really been enjoying the music career of John in the last years. Like, I love the Lost Themes albums. I've actually been digging into the backlog of Cody Carpenter's stuff. Oh, his stuff is good, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. He's great at synth. He does a lot of great 8-bit stuff. Great piano player. Just if you ever see the, just him riffing on a piano, you post these videos up on his Twitter, which are just gorgeous. I love it. I'm not always a fan of adding the percussive rhythm to the theme because I know, Alex, you and I talked about that when Alan Howarth started doing the scores with John Carpenter and then taking over them. Mm -hmm. What made the original Halloween theme in 1978 film, which is the only film that's done this, so striking is that it's slightly off rhythm. Mm -hmm. Da 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 da. A little pause. Da 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 da. It's not all precise, it's just slightly off. That gives it just this slight little eerie chill. By adding the percussion under it, they've smoothed that out so it follows perfect rhythm. And I've never been the hugest fan of that. They just kind of make it more relentless and more monotonous, where it's just constantly playing. And that's where they get your eeriness from. I think this film, it still does that, but I really like how they do it. It still has a good eeriness to it. They almost soften it a little bit so it's not as piercing. And that almost makes it a little eerier. I also like to kind of rattle that that's always going to because mm -hmm. yeah alan howard would always just do it to a synth drum beat but i like how they get more of the rattle here i love the guitar bits i love that deep guitar and that's interesting here that they used a violin bow for that it was interesting seeing the three of them they have a good energy together i've not ever listened to the lost themes or anything like that but it's made me want to go listen to them because this was really great oh yeah lost themes are classic carpenter and cody has some nice flourishes of his own that he, he brings to things and i'm not as familiar with the other musicians so I, I can't really tell like what individually he's adding to it but i'd still love to look through his catalog just to kind of see what he's done on his own it's a great score i think it's absolutely the best thing in this movie it's a good movie so it's saying a lot that it really stands out mm -hmm. Alex, anything else you can think of that you want to bring up on this movie? No, I think I covered all the important stuff. Mm -hmm. Bond meat sandwiches are good. Yep. The pudding is actually cheese dip. They should have had an open concept house with less closet space. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe don't have corners full of mannequins that people can hide in. I don't understand why they have mannequins. Like, I get why they would target practice with mannequins out there, but she has to have seen a horror film and she has to know that she's setting up a set piece. Yeah. That's pretty much all I've got. I enjoyed the movie. What if the house were like full of more booby traps? Like the whole corner full of mannequins is itself a trap. That'd be cool. There's like bear traps in the mannequins. And just marbles. Marbles yeah. everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and then a giant paint can flies down the stairs and hits Michael in the head. Yeah. And he falls on the micro machines. Yeah. I was going to say, what if this entire film was just Laurie Strode in a booby trap house with Michael Myers? But that's basically what the movie The Collector is. 
<laughs> what they should do is they should just spray glow in the dark stuff everywhere and then get him so you can see him. Ooh, what if they went all black light? Yeah, go yeah. all Joel Schumacher with it. But I do enjoy that Lori comes out of the shadows at the end as well for the Happy Halloween, Michael. That was really cool. Yes, yes. And then the, she got that bit where she disappeared after falling off the balcony. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was cool. I do uh, think that that family should have saved their money and maybe gone on vacation during Halloween. <laughs> maybe went to the tropics. Maybe Ray would still be alive with his yo-yo today. Exactly. <laughs> Again, I think it's a good film. It's a good sequel. I still prefer H2O, but it's kind of one of those things where it's like, I'm not really as much in a ranking as I am Tears. Mm -hmm. This is one of the best of the sequels. H2O is the only other sequel I can think of that would be on the same level as this one. I like 4, but it's a mess of a movie. Yeah, I'm going to be honest. I like the original H2O and this and bits of Halloween 3, and that's yeah. pretty much where my interest lies in the franchise. 2 was very hit and miss. Yeah. 5 was what the fuck. Yeah. 6 was, oh, you've got to be kidding me. Yeah. <laughs> 8 was, really? 8's fun, but it's not good. Yeah, it's a fun, bad slasher movie, but it's yeah. not a good Halloween movie. I can't hate anything with Busta Rhymes kicking people. <laughs> and the only thing that keeps, I want to say, Zombies Halloween 2 from being on the same level as these two, because I think Zombies Halloween 2 has even more powerful character stuff, but it's so inconsistent in terms of everything else. Like, all the Michael Myers stuff is terrible. The third act is terrible. But all of the Lori, Annie, Sheriff, Bracket character stuff is, I think, some of the best stuff in the entire franchise. Yeah, I agree. It's just not in a film that's as good around it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. The original Halloween's still the best. H2O and 2018, they're pretty neck and neck for me. I don't think I love H2O quite as much as you, know, but I still really, really like it. It's still one of the best sequels. I kind of love that middle trilogy of 4, 5, 6, just because it's not good, but it's good schlocky horror film stuff. It's not good as a continuation of the original Halloween story, but it's fun. Zombie stuff, it's so out there and different. It's hard for me to really say. I love individual moments and characterizations and stuff they do, but then zombie has to zombie it up so much, it's hard to really recommend that. You have to watch part one in order to appreciate part two, and it's hard to recommend part one. Yeah, and then I just can't stand Halloween Resurrection. I know you guys had fun with it, and I do not fault you at all for oh, it. Oh, it's a terrible Halloween movie. It's terrible. It's a terrible movie in general. It's on the level of an urban legend sequel. Yeah, it's bad. I can't rewatch that one. We're nearing the end here, so I just wanted to, I reached out on Twitter to see if anyone else wanted to share their thoughts in the movie. I just had a few people send in messages. First was from Angel Tusa, my co-host at Shumacast, who again was the person I went and saw this movie with. She said, I could have done without the psychiatrist twist, but I enjoyed the story of Laurie and her daughter and granddaughter. Watching the original right before we went helped me appreciate a lot of the nods to it I would have otherwise missed as a non-fan. Greg Hood, the wonderfully bearded Greg Hood, said he intended to write up his views upon watching the film, but ended up losing himself in the film. Definitely parts I did not like, threads they could have followed up on, and a few cop-outs for sure. Imperfect, but serviceable. Mark Alley, the author of, hang on, let's check, I actually have his books up on my shelf. The author of The Thing from the Drive-In and I Was Geeky When Geeky Wasn't Cool. He said, I enjoyed it very much, respectful of the original, but with enough twist to keep it feeling fresh and modern. More like this, and I think fans will be happy. And then finally, Tim, the co-host of Cinema Spection, a wonderful podcast I'm going to be guesting on very soon, probably before this episode comes out. He said, I loved it. I appreciate that by removing the family connection between Laurie and Michael, Michael's motivation is back to savage random murder. While Laurie has been focused on Michael, what was a traumatic encounter to her means little to him. He's not interested in going after her until she attempts to stop him, and even then has to be pushed into a confrontation. I also appreciate that there is no male heroic character. Most of the men are ineffectual assholes or just plain evil. It's refreshing that in the end, these three women, bound by their traumatic family history, can only rely on each other to stop this evil. A lot of good insights there. Yeah, it's nice to hear some positivity. When I saw it, a lot of my friends weren't fans of it. I'm enjoying yeah. uh, positive feedback for it because I'm a fan. Yeah, I mean, even like the whole men angle, I thought Officer Hawkins was a great character, but he was just cut down by a bad plot twist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, the whole thing about the family coming together through trauma. Yeah. What I like is that Allison is the one who hasn't been traumatized, but is pissed that she's getting sidelined by her mother and grandmother's trauma and how that affects their relationship and all that. Mm -hmm. I do like, yeah, that Michael isn't coming back to go after Lori. He's coming back to town because that's his town. He kills and then, hey, who's that outside the window? 
It's yeah. an old friend. I haven't seen her in a while. Yeah. And then on our final segment here, let's look at the box office release of the film. Alex, what do you think the budget of this movie was? Oh, God. Uh, 20 mil? 10. Wow. wow. I know Blumhouse is known for being a cheaper production company, but I'm mm-hmm. shocked that I would think having Jamie Lee cost a little bit more just to get her back. Yeah. And then this is the first Halloween release in a Halloween film in a long time because almost all of them were like summer. I was excited about that. That's why I yeah. saw it in theater. Yeah. It actually opened October 19th. So it was open like the week before Halloween, but allowed everyone to settle in. And other things that were in the theaters at the time were A Star is Born, Venom, Goosebumps 2, First Man, and The House with a Clock in Its Walls. Remember that one existed briefly? I saw it with my kids. It was not good. Halloween opened at number one. Yeah, it was big yeah. business. Looking, it's like nothing else really opened that week except for Can You Ever Forgive Me in mid-90s, both of which were indie releases that opened in like the 20s. Mm-hmm. But I mean, this opened to a weekend box office of $76 million. That's pretty sweet. Mm. That is huge for especially like yeah. a slasher film. I know the anticipation for this was huge. Because remember, the yeah. trailers were great. The poster was great. The poster is so good. All the font is correct. Like the advertising campaign and promotional materials were just so good. I know. Yeah. So in its second week of release, Johnny English Strikes Again opened at number 12. The Gerard Butler thriller Hunter Killer opened at number five and Halloween was still number one and still Mm. pulled in over $30 million. That's pretty sweet. Yeah. In its third week of release, Halloween was finally bumped down to number five. And that's because Nobody's Fool opened at number three. I don't remember Nobody's Fool. Tiffany Haddish comedy. Oh, okay. The Nutcracker in the Four Realms opened at number two. Hmm. And opening at number one was Bohemian Rhapsody. Oh, yeah. That was a juggernaut. Yeah. In its fourth week of release, Halloween was already down to number nine. That was the week that The Girl in the Spider's Web opened at number six. Another big bomb. Yeah. Yeah. Overlord opened at number three. And Dr. Seuss's The Grinch opened at number one. (laughs) Which I went to see in the theater with my daughter, who was very excited. Nice. In its fifth week of release, we'll leave off here. Halloween was already down to 17. That was when Widows opened at number five. Hmm. I was surprised that that one opened so low. That one looked really good. Yeah, it had really good word of mouth. I don't know what happened there. Opening at number four was Instant Family. I don't remember that one. Do you? That was a comedy with Marky Mark. Okay. And then opening at number one was Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald. Ah, uh, yes. Uh-huh. I still haven't seen any of the Fantastic Beasts movies. I couldn't make it through the first one. <laughs> I'm kind of waiting for them to all come out, and then I'll just plow through them all. Yeah. So yeah, that was the release of Halloween, and despite the fact it did drop off pretty quickly there. My memory was that it hung around in theaters longer, but even then, a $10 million budget, it made $150 million at the U.S. box office. That's big business. That's a sequel right there. I was gonna, yeah, as I say, like, I think we're going to get a sequel. We'll be back in a couple years' time talking about the sequel. Because I think the most successful, if you set aside adjusting for inflation, the original film, was Rob Zombie's first one, which I think did 80. Mm. So this still far surpassed the Rob Zombie one. And overseas, it did well, too. If you add the overseas, it did 250. Wow. Yeah. For a $10 million slasher movie... Basically, the 11th installment of a franchise Yeah, did pretty well. I think there's something to be said for bringing back Jamie Lee Curtis. That seems to be the trend now is taking risks on older actresses being leads in movies that normally they wouldn't be in. And that's kind of awesome. JD, what would you hope for from a sequel to this? I hope they avoid now that Michael is quote unquote dead. I don't think he's dead. I don't want to make Lori the bad guy. I think you might be able to do a story where somebody takes over Michael Myers' place. The mantle of the shape. Yeah, but I'm not sure if I'm really interested in seeing that. So I hope they touch on some of the things that worked well in the zombie Halloween and focus on these three women trying to move on with their lives after having lost everything to Michael. But at the same time, I also know eventually it's going to come down to a guy with a mask on stabbing people. You know what I think is going to happen in a sequel? What's that? I think on Halloween night, a bunch of teenagers are going to want to get together with beers and weed. (laughs) And somebody's going to get stabbed. Yeah. Alex, what would you hope for from a sequel? First of all, I need to get an explanation for how much wine was in Judy Greer's wine glass because (laughs) her mother dug some of it and there was still some left. And I have never been to a restaurant that gives portions like that. 
but I would like to see what the, the creative team of this one would do because they wrote it with the intention of a two film arc. Yeah. And I'd like to see echoes, but otherwise I'm pretty satisfied with how this one ended. That's the one thing that has me surprised is that I know Danny McBride and David Gordon Green talked about how they were going to film two films at the same time and release them back to back initially, but then they kind of held off on that. I don't have a dislike of remakes or anything like that. But I do feel that with remakes and reboots, it should be someone who's passionate about the project. And I feel that these two had ideas, and I think that they should go and bring forth, because it's clearly something that worked financially. I know it was with a lot of fans, it was like The Last Jedi, where people were really divided about the direction they took. But I think that these two guys had a very clear direction for this, and it worked. And also revealing that characters aren't related. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, I'd like to see where they would take it. Otherwise, if it's just to go into another sequel where it's just Michael walking around again, then I'm not super interested. Yeah, I mean, if it's just more teenagers getting drunk, I'm not interested. If the idea is that we're just going to have a bunch of unrelated stories and then, like, Lori becomes the new Loomis, eh, Mm -hmm. it's kind of selling her character short. I don't mind this being the end of the Strodes. Yeah. Though I know the three Strode women actresses are all signed on for the next film already. Yeah. JD, like, we did Halloween Returns, where it was kind of a reboot sequel where a large part of that script was Michael breaking loose while on death row on the day of his execution. Mm -hmm. I could see a sequel to this using that setup. Michael was actually captured from the burning house, is put into jail, is put on death row. They're going to fast track his execution. The day of his execution, he breaks loose and it's havoc in the prison. And the three Strode women had shown up to witness the execution. Yeah, I could see that. And I think you could play up these three women fighting firefighters and paramedics and police officers as they're trying to save Michael from the burning building. Yeah, you could have a great opening that picks up where this leads off and then have that follow-up of, now you're stuck in a prison with Michael Myers. Right. There's ways in which you could use that idea, Mm -hmm. just because that was an interesting change of setup. I think if you want to do a couple more films following this thread, I had this conversation with JD on a different episode, but Alex, what would you think about a Halloween movie done entirely from Michael Myers' first-person point of view? The entire movie. Because the first person point of view is something that hasn't really been reused throughout the phrase. It was an incredibly iconic aspect of the first movie. Mm -hmm. But very few of the sequels have ever used it. I think four and five used it for a few sequences, but it's never really come back into play. But if you think about the way the original Halloween is structured, where, Mm -hmm. you know, Michael escapes from the prison, he sees this one girl, he starts following her around, seeing these other people in her life, and then sets up this whole thing where he starts picking them off one by one and builds them into a tableau that he then uses to trap her if you had done that entire story as a first person point of view i think i might like to see it as a short but i think that would be a bit too much especially since i can't empathize with a killer right like serial killer films i like seeing them from the point of view of people who were around when the serial killers were happening or like the detectives or anything this personally would not interest me as much okay i just think it would be an interesting experiment given that we're able to do those first person films now and to be fair maniac the remake of maniac with Elijah Wood has already done that. Okay. It's an entirely first-person perspective slasher movie from the killer's point of view. I'd see a short for sure. But it's like, I think just the wistful way in which there's the slow build, you're getting snippets of these people's lives. A lot of the original film is framed from a voyeuristic distance. Mm -hmm. I could see that still working. You still get the girls, you still get snippets of their life, you still get snippets of their relationships. Not so much that I want to identify with the killer, but it's just that was such an iconic aspect of the original film and nobody's really tried to push that further. Yeah, that's true. I would just be curious to see someone try it as an experiment. Yeah, for sure. But otherwise, it's kind of like, I mean, the whole Michael and Lori being related is a thread that they played out as far as they could even beyond what they could do. Mm -hmm. We've seen films that try to pick up the legacy killer. I wouldn't mind a legacy killer just to explore, well, what happens if a new kid has that same quirk as Michael? Mm -hmm. Halloween is a franchise where it's like we've really hit all the key areas where you could go. I'm not against them continuing to come up with new stuff, but I don't clearly see what the next story is going to be. Yeah. Halloween to me is it never really super fits in the way that a lot of classic horror franchises do because the first film is so good. It's up there with like a psycho where sure there are sequels, but it's very hard to top that because it is a singular achievement to me where it is a prestige picture, in my opinion. And the rest, while there can be good sequels, it just never really comes at it from that kind of angle. 
Right. I think the best sequels are the ones where they still have their own thing they're bringing to the table. They're not just recreating the first one. Mm -hmm. Like, that's why I think H2O really worked well, because it was a good character study of Laurie. It had a lot of interesting new set pieces and stuff that didn't involve Michael in. And it was of the 90s, not yeah. trying to emulate the 70s. Exactly. And like even Zombies Halloween 2, which I really like, is just a fantastic three-person character piece melodrama. Mm. When it's not that fantastic three-person character piece melodrama, it's terrible. But when it focuses on that stuff, it's great. Well, even Zombies' first Halloween film, the parts I liked the best was that first half, which was all new stuff focusing on young Michael Myers. The characterization of a young boy who is slipping more and more into that darkness, spiraling down, that's the parts that haunt me about yeah. that film more than anything else. Once he goes into making Halloween again, that's the part where I get bored. Yeah. Halloween is tricky because with Freddy, you can do anything. Freddy, as long as you get the character down, you can do anything visually with the whole dream reality. Jason is just a killing machine. He is literally just, let's come up with the wildest ways in which a monster can kill people. Mm -hmm. Michael, it's a little different. And it's like anytime they try to make him a little too Jason, it doesn't work. Anytime they try to recreate the original too much, it doesn't work. But it's like there's a mood, there's an atmosphere to him. There's a stillness, there's a patience, there's a mischievous quality to him. There's an intelligence to him. He's a hard character to grab. And a lot of the sequels don't really succeed in capturing that character. It's a challenge, but I would always like to see people try to take on the challenge than just say, no, you can't do it. I want there to be more Halloween movies just to see what'll happen. Regardless of who makes it, I'll be curious to see the next one just because I really hadn't seen any of the other ones when they were still coming out in theater. So this was the one I first saw in a theater. It makes me eager to see more. I just hope it's of this quality or better because I don't want to go back into that slide of, well, let's just do it all over again. You know, let's just have him kill another group of teenagers. At some point, you can reboot it, and I don't mind taking another step. Oh, I don't mean like in terms of remake. I just mean in terms of like you had joked. Okay. We're going to have a whole bunch of kids who are going to smoke pot and drink, and a bunch of them are going to get killed. And that's fine to a certain extent, but you have to have something else other than that. And I hope that we're not going to go into a thing where, okay, this is probably going to be the last film we can get Jamie Lee Curtis back for again. So let's kill her off like we did in Halloween Resurrection and just go back into the formula. No, I agree with that. It's a tricky franchise to get right to the point where I'd say only two sequels have actually gotten it right. Regardless, whenever they make another installment, we'll have another episode of Masters of Carpentry. Alex, thank you for joining us again on this one. No problem. It's been a while. It's been way too long. <laughs> it has indeed. And JD, thank you as always. Thank you. I really enjoy these conversations and finally getting to podcast with Alex. It was a genuine pleasure. Oh, well, thank you. And likewise. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklocke.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Oh, I still want to see it just because I read the book a long time ago, and that was actually one of the first screenplays I ever wrote was an adaptation of The House of the Glockman Skulls. Oh, wow. I wanted to write a screenplay because I'd been studying the format, and I couldn't think of a story, so I'm like, let me just adapt a book just for practice. That just happened to be the book I had just read. There you hmm. go. I'm curious to see how my vision and Eli Ross compared. I'm sure it's pretty close.